This is episode 28 of Hoops Forum, a production of Radius Athletics and a Quick Timeout podcast. I'm Tony Miller, and I'm joined once again by my co-host, Randy Sherman. Thanks to our sponsors over at 323 Sports. Right now, they're offering several options on team packs, including one for under $100. It includes a jersey, shorts, tee, and a backpack. To find out more about what they can do for your basketball program, visit 323sports.com, or you can contact a rep sales at 323sports.com. They'll be sure to do it right for your sports program. Today is one of those shows where we're attempting to kind of go deeper into a topic rather than talk broadly about a system of play. For those of you that came here expecting pack line, that still is our topic, but we're zeroing in on a few aspects of the pack line defense. And really today is just a chance for us to discuss maybe some teaching points and hopefully help some of you out there become better teachers of the pack line defense. Before we get too far into things, Randy, Thanks for joining us again this week. Uh, yeah. Pack line defense, maybe your experience with it, background with it, and kind of tee us off into some of the things that we'll talk about today. Yeah, some longtime Twitter followers might think it's kind of funny that I'm talking about this because like, I tend to, when I talk about defense, more focus on pressure man-to-man, a little bit of two-three zone talk, but, uh, but mostly pressure man-to-man was a style of man-to-man that I coached and taught and um, am most familiar with. But of course, um, this pack line defense has become uh, popular and widely used. So in my work in helping coaches, I've I've felt compelled to learn it in a, in detail and and uh, really sort of wrap my head around the rationale and underpinning under underpinning on why you know the you know what what's the philosophy, what's the goals and aims and objectives of, of, of pack line defense um, spoken with some really terrific coaches that run it and run it well and are big believers in it and highly committed to it. So um, I've learned from them and, and relayed that knowledge uh, out into the internet abroad based on um you know, my own interactions from learning from others. So yeah, don't have necessarily experience coaching it, of course, played against some teams that did it, but, but uh, you know, I think, I think that if I were to be tasked with coaching this, I think, I think I could do it, even though it's not necessarily maybe my preference. And the reason why I say I could do it is because just like the pressure man to man philosophy, there's, there's a there's a reason for why you're running it, and I and I get that, and I get why a coach would would do it. The, the number one you know objective around running it, and two, just like pressure man, there's some just like absolute teaching points that like, hey, this is what we've got to be great at. This is what we want to happen, and what we need to kind of stay away from. And those are really black and white, and and coaching in that fashion is something I kind of latch on to anyway. So. I think I could coach it, um, even though it's maybe not, you know, my my jam. But yeah, we ran it here for probably about the first six years of our program. Mm-hmm. Had a lot of success with it for a team that was a little bit undersized, not as athletic as some of the other teams that we played against. Um, you know, if you have a team that's real disciplined, obviously, if you have certain parts components, it makes it more effective. I'm thinking sure. of like Virginia and some of their athletic big guys, longer big guys. Um, you know, you. Uh, I, I mentioned all that just to say you may adapt it. Um, there are some yeah. purists who may be watching this, where we say, you know, you can do this, and they they absolutely hate when you when you kind of mess up what what was already created. Um, but mm-hmm. from my experience, some things you just have to kind of adapt and change based off your personnel, like anything else. And so that's kind of the point with today. Kind of again, may not be a lot of new information, but teaching cues or teaching points material again, and to maybe help you become a better teacher of it. Okay. Um, kind of Randy here, why don't you just start us off with the basics and I'll pull up the PowerPoint. We're going to be using some of the fast draw um, diagrams. So for those of you that are listening to this, if you want to go back and watch the full episode on Randy's Radius Athletics YouTube page, you'll see the fast model diagrams there. And then also some video too, to help with that. Let me just say, Mm -hmm. as far as like teaching this, those of you again, who already know about the pack line, let me encourage you to maybe take these and use these with your team. They can be some great tools. Randy, 
about 99% of what we're posting here, stuff that Randy has put together. And whether that's a diagram that you can share with your team or something video that you can show to them to back up the teaching points, there are some really great resources here just in the few slides that we have. So I'll go ahead and pull this up. We'll start from the very beginning, Randy, with just some of the basics and just kind of go quickly through those. And okay. then we'll get into some of the videos and some of the other specifics that we have for today. All right, so the first diagram that you see um, on your screen would be kind of some geography landmarks, if you will, of, of the pack line defense, uh, starting from the top of the pickup point. Uh, I think, I think uh, you know, like that might be one of the things that you could vary based on personnel, like you mentioned, that could be higher, lower. But I think somewhere around where I have that blue line stretching across the court is like the classic pack line pickup point where we, we pick up the ball, the dotted circle that sort of parallels the three point arc um, is sort of the namesake of the defense, right? That's like an imaginary line. That's like maybe in your practice gym taped on the floor or something like that. Um, uh, that sort of parallels the three point arc, maybe a few feet inside of it. Uh, you could maybe get specific to how many feet or something like that. But, but, uh, but sort of the idea that like, when I'm guarding the ball, I'm the only player that's sort of allowed to be outside that dotted line. The rest of the players um, need to have at least one, if not two feet, inside the pack line, hence the name pack line defense. So um, that, that's the namesake, that, that, that um, idea that we've got one player who's guarding the ball and then four players and sort of like they're also helping guard the ball with their positioning by by contracting around the paint um, in frame two here, you see X2 and X3 sort of protecting in the elbows and, and shrinking the gap space between the two, uh, you know, the ball and, and the players on the wing. So um, third, moving on, moving toward the baseline, that blue box um, called the post box in pack line would be, you know, we don't want the ball in there. If it gets in there, we get it out. We don't want it driven in there. We don't want it entered in there if it's entered into a post uh, pack line teams purist would would oftentimes double the post to get that guy to kick it out it's like that's the most threatening area obviously around the rim so we don't want any catches any drives if the ball does make it in there we got to we got to get it out um so yeah so that that would be some just basic geography and and teaching points from my experience, I would encourage coaches, if you have the ability to, to put down some floor paint, uh, floor uh, tape for that pack line. There's just something about the players being able to, you can freeze it and then have them check their feet instead yeah. of, hey, get back in the, get back, get back. You're out too far, especially for younger players. I mean, at the college level, I found this to be true. Mm -hmm. You can show them that on a, on a diagram, which is a great start, but a great visual for them is to be able to tweet, check your feet. And that's yeah. another teaching cue that we use. Check your feet, check your feet, check your feet so that they can see whether or not they're inside the pack or inside the paint or inside that post box on a double, like you said. Ball goes into the post. All right, freeze. Everybody check your feet. What should we have been doing here? Or mm -hmm. great job doubling the post. He's inside the post box, whatever. So yeah, yeah okay. The uh, suggestion that I yeah, would Yeah, I think, I think that may be something that makes sort of an abstract concept of, hey, we're all guarding the ball. Mm -hmm. concrete hey get a foot at least inside that dotted circle that yeah. we have taped on the floor <laughs> for sure for sure all right next slide here go ahead and show some video combination with video and some diagrams here yeah to me this video in the right hand corner lower right corner will just play on repeat so that's good while i'm talking of uh, to me like if just again full disclosure no experience coaching this but like just observing it and studying it and working with coaches who, who are really married to this defense um, I would say this is the killer thing to master. Like this is the thing like, and what Virginia is such a good example of is what I call going on to off on means I'm on the ball. The player passes it. Um, I go from, from on the ball. And when my, when the, my check, my guy I'm guarding passes it to, to a teammate, I immediately go into that pack line, into that gap, create that flat triangle. And the three players I have highlighted here, I thought this was a great clip. And then using the shape, the the circles and the connected line just shows how connected and and good example of 
of, uh, you know, when the ball's passed, the guy who's on the ball immediately goes off. The guy who's off immediately goes on. There's no, there's no hesitation. Um, and, and it's, and you can see that in the video, they just, um, what I would, my own personal language would be don't get split. And, and you can see, uh, you can see the team that Virginia is playing against, try to dribble, split them, try to dribble, penetrate. And, and by going on to off and back on again and off again, they're able to sort of seal all those gaps and, and keep the, uh, keep the offense in front of them, if you will. Bottom right, the guy in the corner there, the stunt, you see the classic like stunt on the drive. So it's mm-hmm. all comes back, stunt at him, then pop back out. Yeah. Um, I found it's it interesting. Not getting split, just like, mm-hmm. like that, like I said, at the on at the outset, like, I can I can wrap my brain as a coach around absolutes and like an abs we are not getting dribble split. <laughs> like so get off when you're on when the ball moves you move. So mm-hmm. go get off when you're on and and when you're off and the ball moves to your man get on. Mm-hmm. And 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 that on to off on to off on to off uh you know toggling back and forth between that like how fast can we do it? How how aggressively, how electric can we be in the gaps? Like I think that's what would be really, uh, uh, I mean, the cornerstone. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, teaching them that don't get split makes a very simple point of actually. If you see the top, the slot to slot pass here is that I don't know if that's Kyle Guy number five there, mm-hmm. but he actually doesn't stunt. He just stands and holds his ground, which is kind of a yeah. key thing. I uh, have found that sometimes teams overhelp on the stunting. And so if they take two or three steps away from their defender, then it ends up a long closeout and it becomes a wide open three. Um, but it's the balance between not getting split and overhelping too much there. Just a from my Yeah, experience. he's in good position, forces the kick, and all he has to do is one way back to his man. Right. Right. Because okay. he got off quickly. He didn't hesitate when he got off. He was in the gap early. And now he's just got one direction help back to his man or one direction recovery back to his man. Yeah, that's good. All right. Next one here. This is uh, we wanted to include for you some things, some small sided games. You can work with it. And Randy, you can go ahead and throw this. This is our three V three on to off small. Yeah. So this would be just sort of if, if, uh, if breaking down this concept could, could that we just saw on screen with three, um, three perimeter players and three defenders to practice going on to off. I just kind of drew this drill up. So got a coach under the basket with a ball and, and the, and X one, two and X three, the defensive players in orange, they're, they're sort of blind. They are, they're, their backs are to the coach who's standing behind them. So when the coach passes the ball out to one of the um, players spaced around the perimeter wing point wing, they don't really know where the ball is going to go, but they get to, you know, practice a closeout and forcing middle and all of the, the, the you know, and they have to sort of do it randomly because they would be blind and wouldn't know if the ball was going to go to their check or not. And then, and then you're just checking for positioning of, of the, the, uh, the players not guarding the ball. Are they in the pack? Are they, if they're one pass away, is there, are they in the flat triangle? If they're two passes away, are they getting all the way to their help? And, and, and uh, so the sort of constraint uh, to tap on what we talked about last week, the constraint I would put on this drill would be like, we want to, we want to get the ball around the perimeter at least once to where all players have to go on, off, on, off, on. And, and, and then, you know, maybe p- pass it around a couple times. If you're struggling with it, like each, each offensive player has to touch it once, then it's live or twice, then it's live. And then, and then you just play it out from there. But you know, during that part of the drill where it's it's sort of semi-live, you know, we're checking for the speed at which we go on to off, in the gap, back to the ball, back, you know, to the help. Um, you could even allow skips in this drill. Like, as long as all three players touch it, it doesn't have to just go, you know, wing to point to wing to point. You could allow skips where you got to go off to on even further and quicker and more urgently and, 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 um, so yeah, so that would just be kind of a good breakdown, introductory style um, drill to teach going on to off that you can just say, okay, everyone touches it once, it's live, and then start working on your, your you know forcing middle and and uh, you know however you're going to defend cutters and 
and dribble penetration and things like that and like sort of like work on not getting beat baseline, which is another kind of absolute that tenant of pack line defense that you could obviously implement implement when it when we get to the live portion of this drill. Yeah, you mentioned this is a great example from last week, a very simple drill that probably when a coach looks at it, nothing fancy with it, but the constraints is really what makes it uh, applicable and helpful for the players. So I would go then next level based off of the last video that we just watched. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to work on stunting at the ball or being in the gap going on to off off of drives, mm -hmm. then you could say you have to have at least two drives. You have to drive the paint at least twice before we get a shot up. Mm -hmm. It's something else that you could do. So on a great simple drill, drill but one that you can basically use four five six seven times uh that's slightly different by adjusting constraints so i like that all right let's go on to the next one here yeah. um this is one that this is just kind of another small side of game thing that you could do uh start with the coach with the basketball basically is just pounding it for maybe three or four seconds and you've got interchanges on the mm -hmm. other side that's not really something we're going to talk mm -hmm. a lot about today but just moving i have found too when you're introducing this Co players do real well when they're responsible for like three steps, but once they start their, their player starts moving around on the floor, they can sometimes get confused about exactly where they need to be. So yeah. going from being one pass away in the gap to now being two passes away, splitting the court in half or two feet in the paint, whatever you teach. Um, but you could do this and then it goes live when a coach makes a pass to a player. Then you okay. have maybe like a seven second shot clock. And then yeah. based off of what constraints we have, you could do, you have to drive it twice. You have to get a paint touch on whatever you want it to do. So, and once, that. once the ball's entered to a player, all our pack line absolutes are governing the defense, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. Uh, That's good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next one here. Next. This is kind of moving on from on to off. We're going to talk about locking and trailing and dealing with off ball screens. Yeah. So again, my studies and investigations of pack line and talking to um, coaches who run it. And then of course, watching the quintessential pack line, Virginia Cavaliers play. I've observed like this is the, the, the sort of like maybe teaching points around, you know, maybe, uh, an off ball down screen where maybe we are assuming in this frame that you see on your screen, maybe one has passed a three and then screens away for player two. Uh, you know, the three main teaching phrases or, or words you see on the screen, lock trail and show would be one word, you know, commands to sort of latch onto X two. They, they're, they're, uh, their task, if you will, is like, don't get beat, don't get cut back door, uh, you know, uh, lock onto the player, you know, take away the back door, the reject or whatever you want to call it. And then when they come off the screen, just be in their back pocket, just trail, the, trail the, the screen tightly. And then you get help from the screeners man who's going to show on the screen. And, and uh, you know, we've got video to, to, to demonstrate what that looks like. But but basically, instead of just sagging back down in the paint and, and, and where we'd be susceptible to a long curl or a, a, a curl off the screen, we need the screeners man to get up and, and put a hand in the passing lane to sort of deter that the entry into the into the cutter. And then uh, then we, you know, we 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 sort of have defended the screen and we're back to neutral, if you will, on defense. A uh, teaching point that I would suggest is teach your players that are locking off of the, so in this case, X2, mm -hmm. to take their inside hand and put it on the outside hip of the person, try to stay connected. That's another yeah. teaching cue we talk about is staying connected. The farther you get apart, the harder, the more pressure it puts on that showman. Mm -hmm. So your inside hand, so if I'm going around this way, it would be my right hand would be on his left hip. And I'm going to try to stay connected. I'm screaming from the sideline, stay connected, stay connected, stay connected. Yes. Um, because the longer you get drug out there, that gives the chance for the, the screener to roll back. The show guy is late, and that usually ends up with a layup at the front of the rim. So, yeah. Suggestion. Cutters, that the cutters, the ball, you're the chain. So mm -hmm. let's, let's ball and chain this, right? You know, like, yeah. uh, and then, and like you said, and another thing I'd point out too, this may not be pack line purity. I don't know, but like, let, let's let common sense prevail. If, if, if X2 just gets wiped out on the screen, falls down, get, gets tripped or, you know, something, 
it just gets taken out. Like that show could turn into a switch. Like, hey, this is a, this is a nine one one. I got to take the ball, right? Because yeah. the the ball the you know the ball scores. I got to take the guy coming off the screen who caught who made the catch. And my my teammate, I don't know where he is, but I know the ball scores, so I'm taking it. Right. We'll figure it out, right? Right. Okay. All right. For those of you that are listening, let's go ahead and show them some video here. Randy okay. will talk you through the clip here. This is another one of those that's on Randy's YouTube page, Radius Athletics. Just type in pack line defense, lock and trail. Yeah. There might be some like introduction here at the beginning, but maybe not too much. Um, yeah. So we see Carolina um, set a down screen. So, so, um, Player, the jersey number one there's got the ball there's there's a passer i've got the screen drawn on uh drawn on the, the screen and so we've got we should see lock trail right he, he's not letting him go back door he's sort of you know hedging against that and pretty good connection and we get it we get a little bit of a of a show from the screener they get the catch but it's kind of not really a much of an advantage on the catch. So Virginia is able to sort of return back and contest the shot. And I think, you know, what you see there is okay with Virginia. Like you shoot over them. They're okay with that. You, we, we locked and trailed. We got a hand in the face. You shot over our defense. You didn't penetrate and draw us in and kick it. You, you know, you shot over an outstretched hand um, from distance We'll live with that. Very similar to that because uh, we're seeing more stagger screens involved with this. Let's go ahead and show them the staggers. The same principle here, so this isn't anything different, but this is just against the stagger. Yeah, same thing. Just X3 here, can't get rejected, backdoored, whatever term you use. So he's got to sort of be in position to where that guy has to accept the screen, screens in this case, and then and then get in his back pocket and and trail him hard off the screen. And like you said, stay connected. So our showman isn't just forced to really show out there. That's one thing I'd fail to point out is if he is forced to show, show, we're susceptible to a screener slipping, right? Like he can't be forced into showing so far and so long that that the like X2 could seven cut or, or um, that's an old motion term, sorry. X or sorry, player two could seven cut or slip the screen into the paint. So stay connected. So the show is just a, just a showing the hand in the passing lane and you get back connected and back in front of your man. As you mentioned on the last one, I have found this one, you're more susceptible to having to switch. So we typically, they, they usually don't struggle against the first one. So it's a, you know, over the, on the first one and then switch the second one. And I know okay. some teams don't want to do that because a lot of times it's like your five that's involved in that pin down. Sure. Um, but if by chance you're able to switch it, you go ahead and trail the first one and then so stay connected on the first one and then switch the second one. So when exactly. you switch the second one, X3 would then move underneath and that kind of eliminates that that role we'll guy slip. there. Yeah. Yeah. But obviously personnel may kind of uh, dictate what you do there. Okay, same thing here with video. This is the next clip for those that are listening. We'll show you a clip here. This is against stagger screens. You can find this one on his website as well. Yeah, I think if you go forward a little bit on uh, boring introduction. Yeah, so same thing. We're going to see a single down screen first. Should see lock and trail done effectively and show and recover. Really good. Like that's textbook. And then here's the staggered screen. Again, you can see he's in position where he's not going to get backdoored. Um, the, the guy guarding the second screener is going to be your show and recover guy. And he's right in his hip pocket as the guy comes off the screen. Really good. A little bit of penetration, but forces a tough mid-range two off the dribble. We'll live with that for sure. Um, yeah, so there's a horns horns into a stagger from Vanderbilt. Um, same thing. Show kind of forcing a tough two. Man, they're good at this stuff. <laughs> they just do it right. They just do what their coach to do. Right? Just do what your coach to do. It's not that hard. Is it? Yeah, here I zoomed in on the really good long show there. Mm -hmm. Now they shoot over the top of us with a hand in your face. We'll take it. Oh, on that first one, another one that because some are concerned that they'll curl the, the second stagger. Um, 
teaching your players, just kind of a teaching point here, teaching your players not to give up on it and to chase down from behind and try mm -hmm. to contest from behind. Um, that's something rear really contests. Like. If you had to show and they curled, you just wall up and kind of, you know, try to try to play vertically without fouling what you saw them do. And right. You know, take the tough two. And, um, you know what I should have done in this drill that you have on the screen here, I should have shown like you could start it the same way that I showed the on to off drill with the four, three, I'm sorry, the three defensive players blind kind of underneath the hoop with the coach passing it out. So this is really nothing more than just another offensive uh, action item layered onto the same drill. Instead of just passing it around to work on onto off, onto off, we're going to say, okay, same drill. We're going to coach underneath the bass is going to throw it out to one of the three guys, close them out. And anytime we pass off the point, which is where player one in blue is, anytime we pass off the point, they're going to screen away opposite. So, we're we're working on um, not you know not getting beat back door, force the accept, force them to accept the screen, staying connected by locking onto the guy and trailing him around the screen, show and recover big from the screener, um, and then same thing once we've all, once we've kind of done you know one two three re ball reversals that means everyone's had a chance to lock and trail and show and recover. Let's 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 sort of liven it up then and say, okay, now anything goes. We've worked on the key component that we're zeroing in on, dealing with the away screen and, and learning how to lock trail show and recover, and then um, then play live. So we just get three three cycles through, then a, then then it's live and and looking at the technique on the screen aways and and locking and trailing and our all the pack line teaching points related to on the ball stance angle when the ball's on the wing, you know, not getting beat baseline and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, this is, uh, I believe this is the last slide here. Yeah. Um, so I, I would kind of like to do this. Maybe if we, we, um, come back to it again next week, Randy, as far as, um, some of the sure. other aspects of it that kind of build on this, I'm not really sure that this is where, it starts, but I thought this was the beginning of it was really good as far as the, the on to off. Um, but I, I do think that, again, it's one of those things where I found that it will help if you've had somebody that's gone through it and teach it, but then also the showing it and this and describing it, um, maybe it will help coaches communicate it better. I don't know, or, or, or help them with that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as like the, the teaching of the, the basics of it, is there anything else that we missed as far as today, as far as, um, any of the detail skills that maybe things that we could address maybe next week? I'd say closing out would be the utmost important. If, if, if we're going to assume that a player, when he or she is off, is sitting in a gap, like you saw Kyle Guy do, he's off, he's in his, he's doing his work early, he's in the gap, he gets driven at, and he doesn't overreact. He just sort of holds his ground or her ground, and 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 we're going to assume that that's our principle that we're going to adhere to. We're going to be in closeouts a lot because mm -hmm. they're going to drive at you. You hold your ground to to, to protect that gap almost like make them kick it to your guy. And then now I've got to get back. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, that's, um, you know, how well we close out and what, what we're trying, you know, the angle we take, the, the, uh, the outcome we're okay with or not okay with when we, when we approach a close out to me, just as a, um, an, an observer of it and not someone who's gotten my hands dirty with this defense, just as an observer, I would say that that's like critically important. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I would totally agree. I mean, we worked on this for like, we worked on closeouts every, almost every day when we, sure. when we you know, guarding the basketball and closing out, because if you can't do either of those two things, I know that sounds like super basic for any defense, but especially here, if you can't do those two things, it opens up a lot of other things like, um, you know, being able to, if you can't defend, we gave so light pressure a lot of times on the perimeter that they would throw the ball inside and then you have to deal with doubling the post and mm -hmm, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever your solution is to that. So, um, yeah, I mean, just like Justin said here, a, a lot of it was teaching the basics at the beginning, but then I also found that playing a lot at the beginning, uh, opened up new opportunities for them to be able to see, uh, 
breakdowns. And if you haven't taught this before, it opens up like, what do I really need to work on? And you'll quickly find out, even if you didn't need to listen to us, like you'll yeah. quickly find out like what things I really need to really need to spend my attention on. So yeah. um, playing as quickly as possible was a lot of help to us at least. So, um, so I guess then next week we'll go back to um, talking about closeouts a little bit and then maybe guarding the basketball and maybe talking about some, some double ups as well. But again, the point with this is for you to maybe take some of these resources, Randy, where are all of these found? We talked about the fast model site, but where else are, are these found that they can find all of this? Um, I would say the, that the uh, team uh, dot fast model sports.com blog. I did a kind of a short series that talked about pack line, not only from the defense perspective, but kind of, okay, how, how would be a good way for an offense to attack it? So you just go to team.fastmodelsports.com and the search function, put in pack, pack line, and you'll get populated with both of those pack line pointers for your offense and then sort of some, some uh, uh, defensive basics, if you will. Man, but uh, I've got some videos on my YouTube like we just saw. You could go back and watch those. And and, uh, and several of those are embedded into the blog post. So we, sure. uh, we just yeah. grabbed those right out of there. So that's a good population. Um, I, you know, the, the talking about the – I think it is good, too, that you included some of the offensive stuff because then you can know from a defensive perspective a lot of times how offenses are going to try to attack it. Um, and you can uh, adapt and adjust to, to whatever those strategies like are. If too. I have, if I'm, if I have your rules and I know what you're like, mm -hmm. I'm privy to those. You've put those out all over the internet. We don't get split. We don't, you know, like, okay, I, I, then I can design an offense that says, okay, well, here's what they're going to do and let's make them wrong. You know, like, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, yeah. So that might be some helpful pointers for both sides of the pack line, uh, you know, offense and defense. And any of those diagrams that they have there on the fast model blog, you can import those straight into your fast draw and adapt them too. So sure. that may be something you don't have to draw them up for yourself again or anything like that. So great resource there. Before we let you go, we want to tell you about our sponsors over at sideline interactive. If you're wanting to improve the look of your gym or increase the revenue for your program, sideline interactive is the leading manufacturer of scoring tables and display base display boards for high schools and colleges around the country. To find out more, visit sidelineinteractive.com. They'll be able to set you up with a scoreboard for your gym. Appreciate all of those who joined us this week. If you missed any part of the show, you can go back and watch or listen to it. Visit Radius Athletics on YouTube to watch the full episode or search a quick timeout podcast and you can listen on the go to this week's episode. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll talk to you again next week on Hoops Form. <laughs>